Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you all in your living room. Uh, as for myself, I am also in my living room. As you can see, there are couches behind me. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to, today to announce our first guest, uh, Professor Yehuda Lindel. Uh, Yehuda Lindel is CEO of Unbound Tech and also professor at Bar Ilan University in Israel. Uh, Yehuda attended his PhD at the Weizmann Institute of Science in 2002 and spent two years at the IBM T.G. Watson Research Lab as a postdoctoral post fellow in the Cryptography Research Group. Yehuda has carried out an extensive research in cryptography and has published over 100 conference and journal publications, as well as one of the leading undergraduate textbooks on cryptography. And just a side note, it was my textbook on cryptography and I spent a lot of time reading it. Yehuda has presented uh, I'm sorry, you has presented at numerous international conferences, workshop, and university seminars, and has also served on program committees for top international conferences in cryptography. In addition to Yehuda's notable academic work, he has significant industry experience in the design and deployment of cryptography in a wide variety of scenarios. Uh, it is a real pleasure to have you, uh, Yehuda. Please proceed to your talk and uh, have fun. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and I want to thank uh, the organizers uh, for having me. Uh, it's a great opportunity, and uh, it's really great to, to be able to get this done in these times. Uh, so I'm sharing the screen, and I hope you can all see it. So I'm going to talk about, uh, the title is The Path to Software-Defined Cryptography via Multiparty Computation, or really how we can protect cryptographic keys uh, in, in software in a way that actually provides strong guarantees. So just as, as some context to the talk, uh, cryptography is a central tool of computer security. Uh, there's a lot more to security beyond cryptography, but it's something that is uh, very uh, central to it and, and crucial to it. And all of cryptography, as we know, relies on secrets. If you want to do key exchange or encryption or digital signing or authentication, you need to have some secret and that secret is what differentiates the attacker from the legitimate users. So once such a secret is stolen, then all security is lost. It's a really a, a Boolean situation. Uh, you, if uh, your key is well protected and you're encrypting well, then you're secure. And if the attacker steals the key, then, then there's absolutely zero protection. And not only is it zero protection, it also becomes the is, is the easiest attack possible because, in fact, um, the uh, um, once the cryptography is working and you can break the crypto, then you can actually attack via typically via the allowed API, and that goes undetected. So this is different from other types of attacks where the attacker has to behave in an ominous way, and hopefully we can catch them. When the cryptography is broken, it often becomes just the easiest vector of attack. And that means that we need to protect the keys. We need to protect them in a strong way so they don't get stolen. And the legacy solution was, was simply hardware. So you have uh, HSMs, hardware security modules. You have smart cards. You have one-time password tokens. And these are supposed to be very secure boxes that prevent the key from being stolen from them. Uh, actually, the vast majority of effort into these is around physical security. Uh, which is somewhat strange today because very often HSM sit in very secure data centers. But in any case, these are supposed to prevent uh, the key from being extracted uh, by having a limited API that will only do cryptographic operations and nothing more. Uh, and even leaving aside that the security of these actually is not perfect, and if you just want to see one example, look at the talk at Black Hat last year, Black Hat USA last year by Ledger about a complete break of, uh, um, of, a, uh, of an HSM. It was also at the Real World Crypto Conference in uh, January this year. Uh, but even leaving that aside, having these uh, physical anchors when everything is virtual uh, brings many difficulties. The entire computing world has moved to software, virtualization, containers, cloud, 
and that's because uh, it's uh, there's no there are no more problems of procurement and you can remotely manage them and there's a cloud economy and you can have a single interface and environment across uh, uh, the, whether you're in your data center or in in a cloud and so on and so forth and and therefore these uh, hardware anchors actually are a huge pain when it comes to uh, providing a strong cryptographic infrastructure for an organization. And the question that we're asking is, what if we could move to software? Now, obviously, you could move to software, right? I mean, just uh, instead of having an HSM, take that same type of code and put it in a, in a virtual machine and you're done. Uh, but of course, what we're really asking is, what if we could move to software in a way that would still provide uh, a very high level of security, a comparable level of security, if not even better? And that would uh, uh, remove one of the big obstacles to deploying a strong and usable cryptographic infrastructure in organizations. And the approach that uh, I'm going to present in this talk is that of using secure multi-party computation or MPC. This is uh, uh, a well-researched subfield of cryptography. Research began actually in the late 1980s. Uh, there have been th literally thousands of research pa papers about it spent a long time being in the realm of pure theory. I would argue that for the first two decades of its life, it was pure theory. I started uh, researching it in 1998 in the beginning of my PhD. Uh, and I uh, fully admit to being a pure theoretician and enjoying it very much. How to define security, how to prove security, what assumptions are needed to get security. Uh, as time uh, went on, and uh, particularly in the last 10 to 15 years, it's actually become a very applied area of research. A lot of uh, uh, MPC research today is not only um, published in the cryptography conference, but also in the security conferences. So in things like ACM CCS, uh, which is one of the best uh, academic security conferences, you'll see a lot of MPC research. And the idea of MPC is that you can compute on private data without revealing anything, something which sounds uh, like a bit of a paradox, like a bit of oxymoron. You, how can you compute on something without actually seeing what you're holding? So I actually want to start with a toy example and then go into more details later on. And how this actually connects to the notion of protecting keys is something uh, that we'll, we'll, we'll get to uh, uh, after we understand what the notion is itself. So the toy example that I'm going to give is uh, we have three, crop, three cryptographers and they want to compute their average salary. Uh, but without revealing it to anybody else. If you can actually see the salaries here, they are so low that they're just embarrassed to tell each other. And they're cryptographers, so anyway, they're paranoid and don't want to tell anyone their salary. And maybe they want to do this so they want to know are they earning below average or above average. Uh, uh, of course, if they're earning below average, uh, they'll be outraged. If they're earning above average, they'll just think, ah, yes, that's because uh, I'm a better cryptographer. But in any case, so we have Alice, Bob, and Eve, and how can they work out their average? So the first step in, in this toy example is that Alice is going to choose a very large random number. Uh, let's say 652,195. And exactly the domain, I don't want to go into the details, the domain of uh, the way you choose this uh, actually makes a difference. But let's just assume it's a very large random number and much larger than their potential salaries. And then Alice will just add that random number to her salary and send it to Bob. So Bob gets this number, 772,195. And what I want to note before we continue is that from this number, Bob actually cannot know anything about Alice's salary or, or essentially any, almost nothing about Alice's salary because the large random number drowns out the salary. If Alice's salary is 80,000, 100 or 140, and you're choosing a random number from a large enough domain, then this will actually look exactly the same. So Bob gets this number, but doesn't know anything about Alice's salary. And what Bob does is takes the number and adds his own, his own salary to that number and sends it to Eve. So Eve now again gets 877,195, which is just the number that Bob got plus his own salary of 105,000. Once again, Eve looks at this number and says, well, it tells me absolutely nothing because Alice's original random number, again, drowns out the uh, actual salaries in there. And Eve does the same thing. She now adds her salary to that 65,000. Eve is the unfortunate cryptographer with the lowest salary. And she sends that uh, over to Alice. So Alice gets the number 942,195, which is essentially the random number that she started with plus the sum of the other three salaries so she can just subtract that random number and divide by three and she gets 
the final result of 96,666. And what I want to argue is that nobody learned anything. Uh, we already talked about why Bob and Eve didn't learn. They didn't learn anything because all they saw was uh, a random number. Essentially, the, 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 the salaries that were there were drowned out by that original random number. Alice, on the other hand, gets back something that uh, actually has the sum of the salaries, but nothing beyond that. And she can't determine anything beyond the sum of Bob and Eve's salary uh, because she just gets it in one number. And we know that the average and the sum is actually the same. It's just uh, multiplying or dividing by three. Therefore, uh, this reveals nothing more than the average. And no individual has learned anything but uh, uh, the average from this procedure. And this is a protocol that's actually secure up to one party being corrupted. If two of them want to collude against the third, uh, well, in that case, anyway, you shouldn't be computing the function because it revealed it. But this just gives you an idea that it's actually possible to, to compute on data without revealing anything whatsoever but the result. And that's a very powerful paradigm. And I want to stress that in the late 80s, when this was uh, initially researched uh, and, and going forward, it was actually shown that you can compute any function that you want. Now, I'm not saying you can compute them efficiently, uh, that actually can be run in practice, but you can actually compute any function uh, that you would want in, in, in a secure way. With more detail, the setting of secure computation is one where you have parties with private inputs, and they want to compute a joint function of their inputs, uh, but ensuring that nothing but the output is learned. And we call that property privacy, and also ensuring that the output is correctly computed, which is correctness. And you could think about uh, many applications for this, comparing DNA, um, comparing uh, uh, databases, uh, uh, carrying out SQL on uh, SQL queries on databases that are that are held by different parties. You can think about set intersection. I want to compare what contacts are in my on my uh, address book versus uh, somebody else's without uh, revealing anything but the the contacts in common, or even without revealing anything but how many contacts we have in common. And there are many many applications uh, for secure computation. Uh, one thing which we, is important to understand is that these properties are, should be guaranteed even if some of the parties are adversarial, so they're cheating. And there are two main classes of adversaries. One is a semi-honest adversary. Uh, that such an adversary actually runs the correct software but tries to learn more than they're allowed to by looking at the transcript. That's a relatively uh, benign adversary in the sense that they... Um, that they actually are not trying to actively cheat, and it can model some things like inadvertent leakage. Uh, but in general, we much prefer to talk about malicious adversaries, where the adversary can actually run any software that they want. They cannot, and they should not be able to learn anything. And even if they know all the protocols being used and the design and they, and so on and so forth, uh, we actually can guarantee that they are not unable to learn anything, no matter what attack that they run. And furthermore, given that this uh, notion uh, rests on a strong uh, on strong theoretical foundations, the security is mathematically proven. So we actually have a mathematical proof of security that nothing can be learned. Of course, we have to be sure that our proof doesn't have any bugs. We have to be sure that our implementation is uh, actually uh, implementation follows the actual spec, but uh, that there are already orthogonal problems that exist there. And now what I want to argue is that we can use MPC in order to uh, protect keys in, in software by moving from this sort of centralized trust model where a key sits somewhere. And if the key is sitting in secure hardware and that truly is secure, then okay. Uh, but it has all of the functional and operational and other problems that come with it. Uh, but if it's sitting in software on any single machine, then it becomes a single point of failure that if you steal that key, then you can lose everything. And basically what we want to argue is that uh, we can use MPC to build a distributed trust model where keys are shared amongst multiple machines uh, but using a type of sharing so that no subset of the keys actually reveals anything whatsoever. So, so uh, uh, a subset of the shares just looks completely random. You'd actually have to have them all. And further, the shares are never united even in use. So it's not like, okay, we were in Greek. We, bring the shares together for one tiny fraction of a second to do the operation. We don't want to do that because if that happens, 
then at that point, it's actually uh, vulnerable to being stolen. And you have, again, the, the, the single point of failure. But using MPC, it's never brought together. And uh, even if a subset are corrupted and controlled by an adversary and who has full, uh, uh, can run malicious software, et cetera, they still cannot learn anything. And the protection level you get is based on uh, strong separation. I'll, I'll give you an example of that later on. Another uh, advantage is mitigation against insider threat. If you have, if you sh split a key into even just two pieces and you have different administrators now, no longer do you have any administrator having access to the key. And that's a big advantage. So to sum up like how we can get this, so you can think about splitting a key into two pieces. Uh, each share is just complete random garbage without seeing the other one. And we'll see later on in the talk uh, how actually this can, can work. And uh, you can store these shares on separate locations. And only that, you do something called refresh, which means that you change the sharing very frequently. So the key itself stays the same because changing, changing keys uh, very often is extremely painful and not practical, but the, sh the sharing itself can change. And then uh, what that means is the attacker would actually have to breach both machines at essentially the same time before a refresh happened in order to learn anything. Again, I'll go into that more detail later on when we see the actual example of how this can work. Uh, the keys are never combined, and in fact, they even can be generated in a way that's distributed. So they were never at any point in their entire life cycle from generation through use. Uh, they were the key was never in any single place at any single time. And again, mathematically proven security properties, so we're not just you know waving our hands and hoping for the best. We're actually resting uh, uh, on uh, strong theoretical foundations uh, from decades of research. So I just want to give an example of how you could deploy such a, we'll call it a virtual HSM, uh, uh, how you could deploy such a thing in a way that would actually make sense in a real uh, a scenario, a commercial scenario. So think about an organization that wants to uh, uh, be in, in, on both in the on-prem in a data center and also in multiple clouds then uh, they could take, uh, and let's assume we're splitting a key into two pieces. So each key is, is, shared, is, is split into two shares. And then we have uh, um, a pair of machines, which one we call EP and the other we call P. So EP we call entry point and the other we call P for partner. And the entry point is the uh, machine that actually gets the request to doing a cryptographic operation. So this would be the same feel of a network HSM or, or you know, you use a standard library, PK11, uh, uh, Java Crypto or Microsoft CNG or OpenSSL or KMIP, any of those uh, can be fully supported. The entry point gets the request for cryptographic operation and now runs MPC with its partner and returns the result. The key never ever being brought together. So in this specific configuration, you can see that you have one pair split between the the uh, organization's data center and AWS, the second pair, the second pair being split between AWS and Azure, and the third pair being split between Azure and the data center. What this gives you is a combination of very high availability so and robustness. Uh, you would need to have uh, more than one cloud and a data center go down. So you need to have two out of these three uh, going down, and that's very, very unlikely, especially because you can replicate this, of course, amongst multiple regions and locations because it's all software. So there's no problem just having automatic replication. That's first thing. Secondly, the attacker has to simultaneously breach two completely different settings, two completely different scenarios. And that's very, very difficult and uh, even uh, um, a little bit hard to, you know, uh, to imagine that it could happen. And especially they have to be resident simultaneously on both. Of course, there's no perfect security. And if the adversary can do it, then uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, theoretically can happen. But it's very, very hard, almost inconceivable to breach such different scenarios, such different settings at the same time in order to be able to, to, to gain any key uh, information. Of course, all of these machines are further hardened. They do all of the standard measures that you would do anyway. But, um, but this shows you how such a deployment could work. If you have this separation and you can do this MPC, then you would get something very strong, very powerful with uh, high availability, disaster recovery, replication, and all in software. Give you another example of how you could use such a thing. Uh, and then we'll get to, okay, but how does it actually work? And we are gonna get to that, I promise. 
So let's think about the fact we wanted two-factor authentication. We have these mobiles, they're powerful computing devices, and we uh, are using these actually for two-factor authentication. There's Google Authenticator, there's Microsoft uh, uh, for Office 365, and there's Salesforce, and there's others. But these devices are all extremely vulnerable. So the key sits on the device. If an attacker, um, if malware is installed on the device, and that's not very difficult to do because half of the apps in the App Store are actually malware, especially in Android. Uh, but I, uh, uh, iOS also has its problems. Then uh, the key is vulnerable, and you can steal it, and then obviously bypass everything. So how can we build like a virtual smart card or a virtual one-time uh, password token on the mobile? Uh, and not have to have these physical devices, but still get security. So the same idea exactly, you, you split the key shares, uh, not between two servers, but you split the key shares between a mobile and a server, and you carry out the computation via MPC. And that way, the key is never present, present on the mobile at any time uh, to be stolen. Because even if there's malware and they can, they can, you can run malicious code, et cetera, you cannot learn anything about the key. Furthermore, the refresh can actually and take place at every single operation and at frequent intervals. And that gives you strong anti-cloning and detection because if somehow you could get a clone of the machine, then uh, the clone and the real device would go out of sync. Uh, if the real device used the key first, then the clone would be complete garbage. And if the clone used it first, then the real phone would fail and we would actually have full detection of that an attack took place. And, and that's something which you typically don't get with hardware solutions. You can also audit not uh, fully everything at the server because you require a to the operation. You don't have full visibility into all operations because you're auditing in both places. And that obviously is very important for security perspective. And finally, it's easy to use because it's on a mobile. And that you know, is, uh, uh, is something that uh, everybody always has. And you don't need special hardware. You don't have to worry about, about uh, uh, delivering it and procuring it and so on and so forth. And it's also a security advantage because people will leave their smart cards and one-time password tokens lying around, but nobody will leave their mobile anywhere lying around. And if you're, their mobile is stolen, they will know about it very, very fast. Okay. One final advantage, which I think is really important to talk about, because this now goes a level beyond what you can do in other, uh, using other technologies, is moving from key theft to key misuse. The standard model for key protection for cryptography is preventing the key from being stolen. And if you have a database of uh, 10 million credit cards and you know, they're all encrypted and the attacker uh, can't, cannot, can steal the key, obviously they steal all 10 million, 10 million credit cards and, and that's a disaster. If they can get to the machine that acts as the HSM, then they can ask for decryptions and maybe they can do 10,000 before, uh, before they're caught. And that seems, you know, that's okay. It's not the end of the world. So they key misuse is not prevented, but it's also, it's not, it's not too bad in that application. But there are many other applications where key misuse is a disaster. Um, for example, code signing. A single malicious signing by, uh, um, by an attacker is a complete failure. For example, the, it can be the ASUS firmware, which is, uh, um, which is corrupted, and now you can infect many machines. It can be a banking application. And it's not enough to protect from key theft because I just need one signing operation uh, and I can get, and I can now deploy a malicious uh, banking app that customers will, will accept as being valid. So using MPC, we can uh, split a key not between two machines, but actually between multiple machines. And we can define flexible quorums that will say, for example, you need two out of three parties at R&D and one out of two uh, at legal to, uh, to approve the code signing operation, uh, that this actually has gone through everything you need. In fact, you can, you can have uh, arbitrary size uh, sets and numbers of sets, and you can uh, um, set up really uh, elaborate um, business processes that are actually cryptographically enforced. And this is what's really important. All of these parties actually take uh, participate in the MPC, so it's not that you can bypass them and get to the machine that does the signing. If they don't approve, they actually hold cryptographic material. And even if you get to the machine that's the signing, they can't do anything because the key actually is not even there. And you can set the quorum sizes to be smaller or larger depending on need and get very, very powerful uh, um, key misuse protection. All right, so now that's really 
all the background on why we want to do such a thing and uh, what value we can get. And I want to stress that this is not, these are not theoretical, but these actually uh, are things exist and are, are running in production and are being used uh, around the world already today. So this is not uh, just something that can be done in theory. It actually, it's possible to do this in production and get very good performance. What I want to show you now is how this can actually work. And I'll start with a friendly fun problem and then get more into to some math. So uh, I'm going to talk about the dating problem, uh, something that uh, uh, the introverts amongst us uh, may recall our days in high school. And uh, let's say that you want to ask somebody out, a uh, guy and a girl want to check if they're both interested in going out, for example. And if they both are, then they would like to hear yes. But if at least one of them is not, then the output should be no. Right? So if uh, I was interested and someone else wasn't, then the result should be no. And uh, why does that help? Because when I ran this with Alice, Alice said no. And I said yes. The result came out no. Alice actually doesn't know that I said yes. Right? As far as Alice is concerned, it may be that I said no as well. So you could think of running this between all pairs of students in the class or something, and then uh, um, nobody loses face and, uh, and we're sort of protected and we don't mind telling the truth about whether we'd be interested in doing this or not. Technically, uh, actually, you can see that what they're actually doing is computing the AND gauge. So we can actually do this with cards. Alice and Bob each get two cards. Uh, and by the way, the reason why this is interesting beyond what we showed before about the salaries is because the salaries have you know, it's, 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 it's numbers, you add them, they're in a nice uh, algebraic uh, uh, structure. Uh, but this is something, an AND gate is something that it, it seems more difficult. So let's see how it works. So Alice and Bob each get two cards. If Alice likes Bob, he puts the king, she puts the king first and the ace. And if not, she puts the ace first and the king. And Bob does the same thing, but in reverse. If he likes Alice, he puts the ace and then the king. And if not, the king and then the ace. And I know that anybody looking at this is going to say, hi, I don't know what you're talking about, but bear with me, uh, you will in a moment. Then each turns their card over and they put an ace in the middle. Okay, so Alice puts her cards down, Bob puts his cards down, and we have an ace in the middle. And we uh, um, note now that if you were to turn them all up wide, that if Alice and Bob like each other, you get a king ace. That's Alice's order the ace in the middle, and then Bob's cards, which is an ace and the king. So you have three aces in a row. But if you don't, if they don't like each other, then it's going to be one of these three configurations. And what you can see that all of these three configurations are actually exactly the same up to a rotation. So there's always one ace, a king, two aces, and a king. Even the third one, the third uh, uh, configuration here, it's also two aces in a row because the first and last are actually next to each other when you think about rotation. So what that means is the parties will turn over the middle card and then randomly rotate. So Alice will pick it up and, ran and rotate. Bob will rotate and they'll open it up and look. Are there three aces in a row up to rotation or are there only two aces in a row up to rotation? And they'll know whether they're going out for a date or they're not. Um, and the point is that because the three configurations which relate to either Alice saying no or Bob saying no or both saying no, all these configurations are identical, so actually they have no idea which one is the correct one. And all they know is that at least one of them said no, but they don't know if it's one or two. And therefore, uh, even introverts can, uh, um, can solve uh, the dating problem without losing face, and hopefully uh, we can help introverts out. But let's come, back to, let's, look, let's come to something which is more serious, which is how can we compute the RSA function? So uh, I have all the modular notation in here, but it really you can just ignore it. It's not important whatsoever for the, for, for the uh, uh, understanding what's happening here. So in RSA, the private key is a modulus n and an exponent d, and the public key is a modulus n and an exponent e. And the private operation, either for signing or decrypting, is just to take some value y and raise it to the secret value d. Okay, and if it's uh, decryption or signing, it, that will change what Y is. But the operation, the secret operation is raising to the power of D, and that D is, 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 uh, is the private key that has to be kept secret. So the first thing we want to do is share this value D between two servers, S1 and S2. So S1 can just choose a random D1. It's a random value. And server S2 will get D2, which is D minus D1. 
Uh, the mod here is 5 and not n for technical reasons that I don't want to go into here. And what you can note is that d1 plus d2 equals d. Okay, so they hold two random values that sum to the real, the real secret key. And the security just at this stage uh, to note is that D1 actually reveals nothing about D because it's just a random value. It's a random value completely independent of D, uh, so obviously it can't reveal anything. But D2 also reveals nothing about D uh, because D1 completely hides it. In fact, D2 you can look at as, as like a one-time uh, a pad encryption of, of D, and so each server, S1 or S2, having D1 or D2, actually know nothing whatsoever about the key D. And now uh, we have this situation where they hold additive shares, we call these additive shares of D, and you can compute the private operation Y to the power of D by S2 computing just Y to the power of D2, S1 computing Y to the power of D1, and then multiplying them together. So just multiply these two public values now, Z1 and Z2 together, and verify that it's correct. And what you can note is that because you're multiplying two values that have the same base and different exponents, you're just adding in the exponent. And when you add in the exponent, then uh, you get that from y to the d1 times y to the d2, you get y to the d1 plus d2, which equals y to the power of d. And so they've actually computed the correct operation, but neither of them saw the full key d. So each one just did a local operation and we combined it together and nothing was revealed. In an actual deployment type scenario, you can think of two servers holding D1 and D2. Some client wants to do some decryption. It sends a ciphertext. Uh, the uh, first server, which for example, we call the entry point in that cloud configuration, sends a ciphertext to the second server. The second server sends back what we call a partial decryption, which is Z2, uh, which is Y to the D2. And the first server then computes again y to d1, multiplies them together, and sends back the result. Um, one thing that I want to set to, to just to stress is that we actually have formal definitions about what security would mean here, and that nothing more are, is revealed about the key than the result. And we can formally prove this protocol according to that definition. I'm obviously not going to uh, kill you with those details here, but actually uh, you can write a formal definition uh, and a formal proof that this protocol reveals nothing more than you would get from just getting this, the uh, pair of ciphertext and plaintext. So if RSA is secure, then this protocol is also secure. And this holds even if one of the servers is corrupted and you have an attacker running malicious code, they cannot learn anything at all. Well, what about the refresh? As I mentioned, we want to change the sharing of the secret frequently, and we'll see in a moment why that is actually very helpful. So we have two servers that are holding D1 and D2. And they can do coin tossing. It's another MPC protocol to get a random value R that uh, neither can influence. And then the first server can compute D1 prime, which is D1 plus R. The second can compute D2 prime, which is D2 minus R. And then note that D1 prime plus D2 prime actually also equals D because you're just adding R and subtracting R. So you actually haven't changed anything. And then I hold a different sharing of exactly the same secret. So nothing they can still continue working. But if an attacker stole D1 and then uh, later on, a month later, managed to breach the other site and they were no longer in the first site and they stole D2 prime, all they would get would be uh, uh, a pair of values that sum to complete garbage because D1 plus D2 prime has this additional R value in there and nothing is revealed. So that's why we do this at uh, uh, frequent intervals, and this this is something called proactive security in the academic literature, and we, we call it refresh here. So that this is pretty easy. You might be looking and saying, "Okay, that's not you know that's not so uh, it doesn't look so difficult." And you're right that RSA is very easy because it has really nice uh, algebraic structure. Elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman, and ECDSA are harder, but they're still not too bad. The real question is, how could you do something like symmetric encryption or HMAC or something that, you know, AES and these functions are just complete chaos. They're in permutations, table lookups. They have no, uh, they have no uh, um, algebraic structure at all. How could you can compute this? And the uh, answer is we can use something called a garbled circuit. So we actually take those functions and we, uh, uh, we, um, represent them as a Boolean circuit. So going back to the uh, 
beginning of uh, undergrad computer science in uh, discrete uh, math courses or in computability courses, we can com we can represent any functions of Boolean circuit, and then we construct an encrypted version of the circuit, and we can evaluate that encrypted version without revealing anything but the result. And I'll show you how that works now. So this is a simple AND gate. Input wire is UV, output wire is W. Uh, here is the uh, um, the truth table of that of that gate. So one and one goes to one, everything else goes to zero. And the first step is to actually replace all of the zero and one values by symmetric keys. Okay, so KU0 and KU1 represent zero and one, and likewise KU0V and KU1V. But we can't give you this uh, uh, table because in the third column you can see that there are three values that are the same and only one is different, and you automatically know that they are the zero value versus the one value. And of course, this holds even if you permute the order of these rows randomly, you would still be able to learn. But I can give you four ciphertexts in random order. And if I give you these four ciphertexts, if you have one key for the U, U uh, wire and one key for the V wire, you would be able to decrypt exactly one of the uh, ciphertexts in the output. Um, so for example, you had KU0 and KV1, you could decrypt the second ciphertext, this will be in random order so you wouldn't know that it was the second one, nothing else would correctly decrypt, you would have no idea actually what you've computed because they all just look like random garbage. KU0 and KV1 look like random garbage and KW0 is random garbage, so you've actually computed something completely obliviously without knowing what you're doing. How can we uh, now use that idea to garble entire circuits? So we have some circuit representation of a function, so we do the same thing. We write random values on each wire, and we build uh, three uh, of these tables, which actually, again, each one is in random order. For here, it's not. Uh, we, we build a table which provides mappings from the inputs to the outputs. And we also provide, um, and we also provide a uh, output translation table, which, which enables you to map. You want to be able to map the uh, values at the end into what the actual uh, output is. This will become clearer once I actually go through how this computes. So now let's say we have the input of 0, 1, 0, 1, and want to compute the circuit over 0, 1, 0, 1. Then what I can do is I can give you the um, key for the 0 uh, value on the first wire, for the 1 on the second, the 0 on the third, and the 1 on the fourth. And I give you these four values that just look like random garbage. And I tell you, now I want you to compute the circuit. You don't know what you're computing, but you could do the following thing. You know KB1 and K0C. Uh, you don't know whether they represent one or zero, but you have these two values, and you can go to this table and you try to decrypt one at a time, and you end up decrypting the third row, and now uh, you actually are able to decrypt only that value, and you get this uh, K0E as the output. You don't know what it represents, but you have this value, and now you can see that you have KA0 and KE0 you do the same thing, you decrypt, you try decrypting each one, you only succeed on the first, you get that output value. Likewise, you now have KE0 and K1D, you manage to get the second value here, then you get K1G at the top here, and now you go to the output translation tables and you get 0 and 1. And what I want to stress that what's happened here is you now know the output is 0, 1, but you actually don't know what the input is. The input could have been indeed 0101, but it could also have been 0001 or 0110. All of these would lead to the same output, and you would actually have, you have no idea which input it is. And this might seem incredibly expensive, and indeed the AES circuit has about 20,000 gates, but with many optimizations, you only need to send these for about 5,000. And we can do this entire thing in uh, under a millisecond. We can actually construct the garbled circuit, and we can, we can evaluate one in under a millisecond, and that's uh, how you can uh, compute even symmetric functions like AES and even HGCM and HMAC, also an MPC, even though they have no structure whatsoever. An interesting thing to note is this is a protocol dating back to Yao in the mid-80s, uh, in the mid-1980s, that was a purely theoretical protocol at the time, but given with many years of optimizations and algorithmic and cryptographic improvements, it's actually something that's in use in, and in production today, which is uh, uh, an interesting win for theory in my mind and showing that theoretical 
research does uh, uh, have, uh, uh, especially in, in cryptography and in many fields, does eventually um, pay off and become something practical. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip a couple of things here. I just want to note that using this, you can uh, really virtualize cryptography, get something that supports business needs, has uh, improved management operations because it's all in software, and without giving up on security, because MPC gives you uh, proven guarantees, you can certify it uh, with uh, via FIPS, and, and uh, uh, it's transparent and agile because it's software, and that's a lot of things that we're looking for in cryptographic solutions. So thank you very much, and I'll open it up uh, uh, to questions. Um, Professor Lindell, it was a real pleasure uh, to listen to your talk, especially for me, which have a special inclination toward cryptography. So Thank we will leave, uh, we will start asking questions uh, on the, the Slido app. Uh, people will still have time to ask questions. So as we said on the Twitch chat, uh, we can upvote questions if you feel the question is relevant or if it's close to the questions you wanted to ask. Uh, otherwise, feel free to ask questions. So without further ado, let's start uh, with the most voted question. Uh, what has been implemented for large-scale data pipelines? So we know big data is a, is a thing now and that people have to uh, learn stuff from large, uh, on a large scale between potentially conflicting enterprise. So can you tell so us for MPC that? on in the large data scenarios, that's actually more difficult. In other words, we can actually use techniques to compute essentially every and anything, but on very big data becomes much more challenging. So when you want to compute smaller operations like cryptographic operations, that's very efficient. We do have efficient protocols for things like set intersection. We can compute the intersection between very large sets. In fact, Google uses this for um, for validating how uh, uh, how many how much people should pay for advertising based on how much advertisements convert to actual purchases, um, you can do quite interesting things on for SQL on data that's separated, uh, and there's been quite a bit of work in the academic community around doing learning, so federated learning or mm -hmm. uh, classification, but but more. If you uh, have a model and you want to, you have an example and you want to verify, you want to get a result on that example without revealing it, these things actually are very efficient. But it, you shouldn't think that, oh, okay, wonderful, now I'm going to run MPC on the Facebook graph and be able to have a social network that is fully private. Uh, that would be much too slow. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I saw that uh, Google uh, released a, a private join or an intersection of, of data sets. I think that's a uh using some kind of the techniques maybe that you yeah. discussed, but maybe yeah. not the garbled circuit model. But. Yeah, so they use MPC. They use actually a version of set intersection, which is based on uh, an elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, uh, or uh, that that's sort of the underlying technology. There are actually uh, much more efficient methods today. They wanted to choose that because it's very simple, uh, which has other advantages. But uh, there are many different techniques, and we can do set intersection very, very fast today. Perfect. Thank you. So next question. Next question. In many industries, any cryptography use will depend on its acceptation from standards. What is the status of standardization for the cloud implementation? So the uh, uh, the point here is that MPC only changes the way you compute the function, but we don't change the function at all. So we can provide the full standard crypto API that you're used to. It's uh, FIPS 140-2 certified, so it's all NIST-approved algorithms. And therefore, actually, there is no problem in adoption because uh, you can look at this and work with it as you would with any other standard cryptographic library. It's just that you're getting protection in software rather than uh, not protecting or, or in hardware, and that's mm -hmm. a big advantage. But, but there is no... Uh, I think it, you know, as a cryptographer, the last thing I would tell anybody to do is to use a proprietary cryptographic scheme or something mm -hmm. else. No, we only want to use the standard, uh, the standard schemes, and, and MPC enables you just to compute it in a way where the sh where the key shares are separated, uh, but the algorithm is the same standardized certified algorithm that everybody accepts, and, and therefore it's not a problem. Professor, just a, a side question to this question: uh, In your opinion, what 
would uh, what is preventing large scale adoptions of such technologies right now? So I don't think uh, that it's being prevented. It's actually uh, uh, there are companies. Uh, Ambatek is one of them who are actually doing this. Um, it's new technology. There is. Uh, uh, we need to educate the market, but the market has heard much more about MPC today. And we actually see these uh, these things are in production uh, quite significantly. It hasn't yet taken over the world. Uh, we hope that that will happen, but it's uh, um, not the situation of five years ago anymore. These, these are actually being used uh, already quite significantly. Perfect, thank you. So the next question is related. How much work is still research work versus development? It's a quite open-ended question. Yeah, so I actually think that it depends what you're looking at. If you have a very specific problem that you want to solve, and there there is enough knowledge, empathy, expertise out there to do it. Uh, you, but it's still a technology that requires higher expertise. It's not like, uh, you know, even, to be honest, even implementing anything cryptography requires expertise, right? Uh, if yeah. we ask someone, uh, an undergrad student who hasn't taken a course in cryptography to, just to encrypt the chance of them doing it right are very small. But this is very, very difficult and requires really high expertise. But if you have a specific problem, uh, uh, this, depending on the size of the problem, they're actually quite good solutions. In order for it to really be something that is ubiquitous as a technology, uh, a lot more research is needed to really fill in the stack going from uh, um, programming languages, so having languages that enable you to write code that have private and public variables, and when it's mm -hmm. private, it runs an MPC, and it will know which protocols to use, and uh, there'll be guidance on how to, to program such a programming language in a way that's friendly to MPC. Uh, there's a lot of research still to be done, and there's a lot of research, it's a very active area of research, also pushing it faster and faster, which is important because uh, as we want to be able to solve more and more problems and the more efficient it becomes, the more problems we can solve. So there's certainly development and there's certainly a lot of research to be done. I think there'll be decades of research uh, still to come in MPC and in fact, uh, even more. Um, but uh, uh, it's already a stage that's certainly mature enough for, for a real use in production. Perfect, yeah. Let's hope it, people keep on researching if it becomes so ubiquitous. So next question is a bit more technical. Does amplifying elliptic curve and iterating more, more time bring stronger quantum resistance as we do by raising iterations on prime numbers factorization? Uh, good question. Um, even there, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's discussion in, in the community as to how effective uh, taking very large primes would be for against the quantum computer. Uh, currently, we don't know. There isn't really enough understanding because the number of qubits you need in a quantum computer depends on how much error you have. There are different uh, there are different models. Uh, personally, I think that um, you know just taking large. If someone really builds a, a quantum computer that can scale and break crypto, and I think I'm in the if camp, not a when camp. I don't yep. think it's it's necessarily we know the answer, but if that actually happens, I would probably uh, be nervous about using something uh, that just raises the size so that it's beyond the current state of the number of qubits. And but there are other things out there. So for asymmetric photography, we have lattices, we have isogenies. There are other solutions, uh, coding-based crypto. Uh, right now, I think if really people are worried about quantum, they should just make sure the crypto is agile. They can switch out uh, algorithms quickly uh, because it's going to—it's still years away. I don't think that most people need to be really concerned yet about changing algorithms. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So it—it it, uh, it actually brings us. Maybe the question was partially answered, but uh, how confident are we that the cryptographic primitives that you described, so mainly the the garbled circuit model, is uh, quantum resistant? So the Garbage circuit model, for example, only uses uh, the actual Garbage circuits uses symmetric encryption only. So if you take AES-256, the best of understanding, that's quantum resistant. In the protocols themselves, there are other elements, but they can all be made quantum resistant. So you can use lattices for oblivious transfer and other elements that you would want in a protocol. Uh, this uh, uh, MPC can uh, work also in, the, in a post-quantum setting. Perfect. So it's uh, it's basically reduced to the Gro Grover search algorithm. Exactly. Yeah. So obviously RSA itself wouldn't be 
secure anymore. The MPC protocol for RSA that I presented is as secure as RSA. Uh, just the fact that RSA isn't secure anymore <laughs> means that it's meaningless. Yeah, perfect. But Thank you. Of course, you could. So the, the next question is talking about RSA, uh, specifically about the example that you that you gave. Uh, in the RSA refresh scenario, uh, where we exchange uh, a R, should R be secret from an eavesdropper? Yes, it should, because if an eavesdropper saw R, then they could steal D1. If someone got into the first the first computer and stole D1, and then just eavesdropped and saw all of the R's, then they would actually be able to keep up to date with the refresh. Uh, whereas uh, uh, the whole point of the refresh is so that if you stole D1 or, or D2, you stole in one of them, and you didn't know a single refresh value, just one refresh value, then it becomes completely useless. For, for someone who hasn't stolen one of the Ds, it makes no difference, that R. But in general, the best practice is all of uh, uh, these protocols are run over mutually authenticated TLS. So this is, isn't an issue. Perfect. Thank you. I think this is all we had uh, as time for questions. I, I see the cues that uh, we're running out of time. It was a real pleasure to have you, Professor Lindell, uh, and I had a good time listening to your talk. Thank you very much. And uh, once again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak here and uh, uh, really uh, impressed by the organization and, and making this event happen. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you.